Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over the last UFC card of the year from a DFS perspective. And for those of you that have been following these videos, you will know that the DFS analysis is segmented into two distinct videos. One we're doing today on Thursday, and the other we're going to be doing a little later, either Friday night or Saturday morning. Um, and the reason for that is the uh, there are two separate skill sets involved in winning these big GPPs, especially in uh, MMA. And one of them has to do with knowing who the plays are. And the other one's completely distinct is knowing how to build lineups specifically for contests like that. So, uh, you know, I've went on a couple of podcasts and talked about how I think the industry does a very poor job in making that distinction and teaching people how to play. And this is what I've decided I want to do with uh, my content in this space is to focus on that distinction. So yes, you do have to know who the good plays are for openers, but that in and of itself is not nearly sufficient, okay? Um, so that's why we break these up into two distinct uh, videos. So this one is gonna be talking about who the actual good plays are. And we'll get right into it by saying that there is one fight that could still emerge as a smash play. And that would be uh, Vincente Luque against Kevin Holland. Uh, Vincente Luque was originally supposed to fight Ian Gary. So when that happened, he was priced as a three to one underdog and uh, quite accurately was priced as a $6,700 fighter on DraftKings. So that fight was postponed and they're considering having him fight short notice replacement Kevin Holland. And this 6,700 price tag is going to stand if the fight happens. And I'm not an expert on odds, you know, in the, on, on the, on the come up, right. But I would imagine that Holland is going to be a very, very small favorite, if at all, um, especially currently on short notice. So if that fight, in fact, happens, you're going to have a situation where Vincente Luque is a, I don't want to say a lock, but a, a theoretical lock. I mean, you have a $6,700 fighter who's, who's probably near a pickup. That's going to be a theoretical lock. So I, I, will, I will just say that up, up front. Um, when we do the lineup build, we will have more clarity on that situation. And again, just because it's a theoretical lock doesn't mean we're necessarily going to even play it. Okay. Again, these are two completely and separate discussions. So everybody, you know, you have to keep an eye out on that, see where the line comes out, but we'll, we'll, we'll cover that when we do the line, uh, the lineup builds in our next video, um, which again, should be either tomorrow night or Saturday. All right. So moving on to the actual confirmed fights, at least for now. Randy Brown versus Muslim Salikov. I'll just get right to it. I mean, this is a very, very poor fight from a DFS perspective. Um, you have a Randy Brown as a $9,200 fighter who's inside the distance line is plus 175, plus 200, something like that. And that's just, just very, very poor. Um, and in the absence of extreme grappling upside, which doesn't really exist in this case, He's just an extremely poor play. Now, again, we're not talking about leverage and ownership and things like that because he is going to be probably low owned. And we can talk about that when we do lineup building. But in and of itself, it's a very, very poor play. Um, and then you have Muslim Salikov, who, uh, I mean, his inside the distance line is about plus 400. So about 20% of the time, I guess he finishes. Um, I guess that's not completely atrocious. But the thing is, is that, remember, his inside the distance line is, you know, it, it's, it's spread out over three rounds. So it, it's not always the first round. It could be a big slate. So you're probably going to need a really good score, even out of your underdogs. I will say this. I, I just, I, I think that Sally Kopp is probably a better play than Brown um, in this. I mean, if he's really going to finish 20% of the time, you know, this is not exactly the right way to look at it, but if he's only going to be like 10% owned or something like that, it's probably a good shot. But again, that's more lineup construction. Overall, I think this this fight is pretty generally a bust, uh, at least as far as the analysis goes. And it's best to kind of move on to the next one. So you have Shamil Gaziev against Martin Budai, uh, two heavyweights. And as usual, heavyweights can go one of, well, could go many ways, but the two main ways they can go is one, just these guys just kind of go after each other. They have no cardio anyway, and one of them just finishes the other one pretty quickly. Or it becomes a completely greasy, just slow-paced fight where it goes to a decision where both fighters bust. Um, so 
that's usually the case with these fights. I would say usually it's usually it's it's, it's one or the other. But let's just take a look at the inside the distance lines here. So you have Gaziev is a plus one ninety, and Budai is a plus one fifty five inside the distance or so. But when you account for Vig, I mean they're both pretty much the same, right? About they're both about thirty three percent to finish, which is I guess okay at these price tags. Now obviously Gaziev being the underdog is as as considering they both have the same inside the distance line, probably the better play just on that. And the other thing is that there is some degree of wrestling upside. I would actually say for both fighters, I mean, I know you're hearing, you might be hearing a lot about the Gaziev side of this, but Boudet has got some wrestling upside too. I mean, he could take some people down. So I do think this fight is, is a fight that you probably want to target and play both sides. The inside the distance line is very strong. For you know, plus two hundred for almost a pick 'em fight is is really is really decent. Um, so we'll uh, we'll we'll attack this fight, and we'll say that one of these guys are probably somebody you want to start with in your lineups. Let's just put these in for now. Uh, okay, Andre Feely versus Lucas Almeida. I can't imagine this fight is being worth anything, but we'll take a look at it. Uh, first of all, as far as the money line goes, we really want to just confirm there's no problems here. Uh, Minus 170 corresponds to about this DraftKings price, so that's fine. And again, it's the same type of, of, of metric we're looking for. We're looking for an inside the distance line of about plus 200 on these guys to make them playable in the absence of very, very strong in, uh, grappling upside, which I really don't even think exists that much in this fight. I mean, I would actually say that the heavyweight fight is more likely to get some grappling going than this one. So we'll take a look at the inside the distance line on both these guys. We have Feely, the favorite, uh, I guess not terrible, I guess plus 200. I guess it's very similar to uh, to the heavyweights, right? Look at that. I didn't even think of this. And look at Almeida. Almeida inside the distance is uh, it's just a little bit worse. So I don't know. I, I guess just based on the metrics, I suppose Feely is close enough you know, to Budai to make it sort of an, e you know, equal play. I do think that comparing apples to apples, I think that Almeida is a worse play than Ghazi. Okay. So we're not going to add Ghazi. We're not going to add him yet. Um, But we'll add Feely to this list here as a best plays. We're going to get the better ones than this, I imagine. But uh, yeah, I guess this is fair. All right. Uh, Ulan Bekov versus Cody Dern, very, very tricky fight. Okay. Because, first of all, once again, you do have this pick them basic, you know, basically pick them price tag. We'll look at the inside the distance line for, I mean, the uh, money line first. And this is actually pretty interesting. You have Ulan Bekov is up to a minus 170. Um, so he's a bigger favorite than well, about the same as Andre Feely and a bigger favorite than Budai, and his price is much less. So you're getting a little bit of line value out of Ulan Bekov here, um, a decent amount, actually. Now, as far as the inside the distance line, I can tell you this, that they're, they're both going to be pretty poor. Um, but let's just confirm that. Ulan Bekov inside is like plus 320, and Durden inside is like plus 700. So the reason for that is both of these fighters are grapplers primarily. So uh, they're really not the type that are going to get finishes necessarily, unless you get a submission of some kind. They're going to win usually by takedowns and decisions. These fights are always very tough because I've heard it argued that whenever you have two wrestlers that are dependent on takedowns to fighting against each other, that oftentimes that can turn into kind of a boring striking battle because what happens is, is if you're a good wrestler, usually you have good takedown defense also. Um, so it usually, it usually, it's been argued that it ends up a kind of a striking battle. But the other way that this could go is something I talked about, I think it was when Ricky Simone was fighting about a year or two, I forget when it was. Another way this could go is if both fighters are really just set on one style, especially with grappling, if one of them is even is an, is better than the other one by at least a decent amount, then the other guy has nothing else to go to. 
and it could end up being a pretty decent whitewash. So it's a very, very tricky fight. Um, I, I will say that Durden has the better chance of winning without getting all the takedowns. You know, I, I think that Durden does have a little more striking ability, I guess, to win that type of fight. So in a weird way, that makes him a worse DraftKings play. You know, I don't think that that Ulan Bekoff uh, has that in his resume. I don't think that his decision wins, for example, come with just striking. I think most all of his wins are going to come with a decent score because of the grappling and stuff. And not to mention the fact that I think he does have some submission upside as well, which is sort of reflected in his inside the distance line. So all, all, all that being said, you, you combine both the money line value, the, uh, the takedown upside and the small inside the distance line of uh, equity. I think that the Beckham is a very strong player. And I think Durden is probably, um, probably a weak player. The only thing, again, we'll talk about ownership later, but I think everything I just said, especially the money line stuff, I think Ulan Beckham might end up being popular as a result. So you'll see that when we do our lineup build, it's possible that we get to Durden as a bit of leverage here. But I do think that Ulan Beckham is the better play, and I'm going to put him in my in this main build, at least for now. Uh, Dustin Jacoby versus Alonzo Menifield, 9,100 versus 7,100. So we know this by now what we're looking for, right? We're looking for, for the $9,100 fighter, and inside the distance line of minus, minus 110 or better, um, in the in the absence of that, we want some really, really heavy inside the distance line value of maybe minus 110. Let's take a look at this. I don't think he gets there. But let's see. Yeah, just, Dustin Jacoby inside the distance is like plus 150 or so. And this doesn't quite cut it. You know, he, he doesn't really have that, that strong inside the distance line prop at 9,100 to make it work. So in the absence of of, of strong grappling, which he does not does not have, I think he is one of the weaker of the higher priced fighters, if not the weakest. But we'll get to others in a minute. Menafield, on the other hand, his inside the distance again, it's kind of like plus four hundred. It's similar to who did we talk about before? To Solikov. Um, like let's see what Solikov was again. Solikov was his inside the distance was. Solikov inside the distance was like plus again, somewhere between plus 300, plus 350, depending on where you look. And then again, Menafield, we're just comparing apples to apples here. Menafield inside plus 350. So it's very, very similar. So I put Menafield on the same page as, uh, as uh, what's his name? As Solikov. But the one difference being that Menafield does have, I guess, some takedown upside. So I think that Menafield, he kind of gets there, you know what I mean, with 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 Solikov as kind of an equal, fringy underdog play. Now, I will say that because Dustin, I will say this about line of construction, that because Dustin Jacoby's metrics don't look great, he's probably not going to be that highly owned, which means that, that, um, What's his name? That Menafield is probably not going to be that great of an underdog play because you don't get that kind of leverage against the favorites um, that are not as highly owned. Okay, let's move on. Uh, Casey O'Neill versus Ariana Lipsky. So this is going to be the first kind of like smash play near the top range that people are going to be going to. And it makes perfect sense. So you have Casey O'Neill, who's, who's minus 190. Um, First, let's take a look at the the uh, the DraftKings pricing. Eighty seven hundred, very very reasonable. You could even argue she has a little line value there, but not much. So eighty seven hundred. But the thing is, is that you, you look at first of all, you just look at her inside the distance line. It's not that great. So O'Neill inside the distance is um, where are you? Like plus two sixty. I mean, that's not great, but you got to kind of read between the lines here. So you look at her, at her wins. You see a couple of things. Number one, you see a, you know, a bunch of takedowns here, but you see just an insane amount of volume. Okay. Like you have 
229 significant strikes here, 137 significant strikes here. Um, you know, the, the combination of and here, 128, 172 uh, regular strikes, because this is what she does when she gets her fighters on the ground. This is just a lot of DraftKings points that can break a slate really, really quickly. So she is a uh, premier play uh, in this uh, in this range. So let's put her in. Now, with Ariana Lipsky, first of all, the money line is not great. The inside the distance line is is really not great. What is she like? Plus, I can't even imagine, like plus nine hundred something like plus eight hundred. The only thing I would say, I mean, she doesn't really have a takedown upside, but I would say to her, her, she has quite a bit of leverage because I think Casey O'Neill is going to be extremely popular. But that's more of a lineup discussion or lineup construction discussion. Just based on her metrics, she's a very, very poor play and shouldn't be played at all. So we'll put Casey O'Neill in here. Um, and again, as we get to other plays, we'll drop players off of this. We'll drop fighters off of this. And we'll be left with what we think are the best quote-unquote plays. Um, all right. Uh, moving on. Cody Garbrandt versus Brian Kelleher. 9K versus 7,200. I mean, once again, at 9K, you're just going to need about a minus 110 inside the distance prop. And Garbrandt is just doesn't have that. It's like plus 170. It's coming off a fight where it's extremely poor, you know, very, very low volume as well. So I can't, I can't imagine him showing up for anybody as, as a good play here. Um, I mean, I would say that Kelleher, I mean, his inside the distance line, once again, is like minus 320. Another one of these guys that's like Salikov and Menafield. I think he is the better of these alternatives. Um, now, again, I'm not going to get into who I like in the fight. That's something completely different. We're going to do a betting breakdown, talk about that. But I will just say this. I mean, Brian Kelleher, I mean, he, these are these guys he lost to are, are no joke. You know, like, these are like title contenders that he lost to. And, and Simon, Simone fought on the freaking main event a few weeks, a few months ago or whatever. Like, I'm not saying Brian Kelleher is like a legend or anything like that, but I mean, make him a big underdog like this and Cody Garbrandt, he lost, lost. And then after a two year, year, year and so layoff, he won a very boring decision, 56 points and a win. I mean, if anything, I prefer Kelleher in this spot. Irene Aldana versus Carol Hosa, 8,800 versus 7,400. Again, for 8,800, you're going to need either a very strong inside the distance line of maybe like plus 110. I'll, I'll give you that one. Or take that upside, which I promise you she does not have. So her inside the distance plus 300, just extremely poor. It's not going to rate well at all. The Hosa side. She has a poor inside the distance line as well. Look at this, like plus like, I mean, a million, right? But she does have some takedown upside. So in her wins, I think that she's going to score decently. So I would actually prefer the Hosa side to these others. I mean, to uh, to Aldana. But again, same thing. You know, I don't think Aldana is going to be popular either. So, so far, we haven't really come across an underdog that has any degree of leverage over the favorite, uh, which is pretty interesting from a lineup build construct, uh, uh, analysis. Is she a better play than any of these others, though? Is she better than, say, Kelleher? Well, you have to make that decision. Is her takedown upside equivalent to Kelleher's inside the distance line? Because they're both very similarly priced. Um, just because, you know, just because we've had Gaziev in here for a while, I don't think he's that much better a play than Hosa. Well, I mean, he's got a much better inside the distance line. Let's say that. But we'll we'll put Hosa in as a reasonable underdog, especially for 150. But I, I don't like the Aldana side at all. Now, again, another thing that we're going to have to think about when we do uh, uh, when we do the lineup builds is we've talked about this leverage from one equation. We've talked about it from the perspective of, ooh, do we really want this underdog if the favorite is going to be that popular? It's not going to be that popular. Well, you can look at the other way. Like if there's an underdog that shows up and their that their price is going to be, excuse me, and their ownership is going to be really high. You could play some of these kind of like bad metric favorites. So if it turns out, for example, and we'll get to this again in the other video, that 
Hosa is like a popular underdog for some reason, you know, whatever, and it's possible that you could play kind of the bad metrics Aldana against her you know, um, to get some leverage, even against the bad, you know, the, the, the over-owned underdogs. We're going to get to an example of that a little bit later. We get to, we're going to get to a really good example of that. All right. So moving on, we have uh, ooh, Brian Mitchell versus Josh Emmett, 8,900 versus 7,300. So, uh, 8,900 for Bryce Mitchell. I mean, say Brian, sorry. For Bryce Mitchell, at that price, first of all, minus 230. I mean, this makes 8,900 a very reasonable uh, money line. As far as the inside the distance line, yeah, he does have a strong inside the distance prop, uh, to say the least. I mean, plus like 300 or so. But his path to victory is very, very grappling heavy. Okay. Um, he, he goes for takedowns. He goes for them often. The only question with him is that sometimes when he gets the takedowns, he just kind of doesn't do a lot with them. He just stays out of trouble and gets the win that way, like in his last fight. And other times he just, you know, just pounds on the guy. And in the variations where he pounds on the guy, you can score over 100. In variations where he kind of lays there, like he did in his last fight, that's when you score 80. And at 8,900, it, it, that's a big difference okay so uh, i don't know exactly what what mitchell's going to end up doing here you know is he content with just getting w's i mean i actually wouldn't blame him you know he got glad he listen he was uh, essentially undefeated for like he had been on a huge winning streak and he got blasted by Tokoria and he came back against a pretty good name dan ige just made sure that he got that win i think that makes perfect sense I think this fight feels very similar, you know, that, that he's now facing another big name in Josh Emmett. He just wants to get some wins together. Maybe it shouldn't go for too much fanciness, you know, whatever it is. And Emmett's, listen, Emmett's got a lot of experience. You know, I don't know if Emmett's going to lay there on his back and just get submitted anyway. So I think that Mitchell might be, I don't know, I don't want to say a fade, but if, if he ends up, let's, I'll put it to you another way. If he ends up being really popular, I think you could fade him. I don't think it's that great of a play. On the other hand, uh, you have Emmett at 7,300, right? So is he going to look this, like these one of these other guys? Is he going to look like one of these, one of those um, Sally Coffs and, uh, and uh, Kelleher's with the, with the plus 400 inside the distance line? Well, let's take a look. Josh Emmett, I bet it's going to be right in there. Emmett inside the distance, there it is, the exact same as these others. So, okay, so this is what I will say. I think that Emmett is probably a better play than those others. Only because, again, not to tease this, but I think that Mitchell is going to be higher owned than those other favorites. I think Mitchell is going to be higher owned than Randy Brown. I think Mitchell is going to be higher owned than... Um, uh, Cody Garbrandt. Uh, so I feel as though that of those underdogs that we talked about already, I think that Emmett is probably the best from a you know lineup construction perspective. And we'll get to that again tomorrow. Sorry. Um, but I do think he's very reasonable. All right. Um, Patty Pimlet versus Tony Ferguson. Uh, we talked about Gary Luke being out. So we're talking about three fights well, two fights in a row that look the same, and then we have the two five-round fights. So we have two fights in a row where we have a huge favorite, and you have real possibility of first-round subs in both these fights. Well, let's just take a look at it. Sorry. So you have Patty Pimlet. He's minus 300. He's probably 9,400 on the board, I would imagine, something like that. At least 9,400 makes sense. So for 9,400, you, you, you're going to want both. You're going to want a uh, inside the distance line of minus 110 or higher. And then in addition to that, you either need significant takedown upside, control time upside, or even like first round upside. And I think that Pimlet's got it. You know, let's take a look at it. Pimlet inside the distance is minus 135. That's really strong. Okay. But in and of itself, it's not like a lock. But considering that he also has takedown upside, I just happen to think that he's a pretty strong play here. Um, 
And not only that, but you have Pimlet round round one even. Let's see. Pimlet round one is plus 300. I guess that's I guess that's reasonable. Is this that great, though? Is that that great? Round one. If he doesn't win round one, like if he wins in round two, what does that look like? Uh, you know what? It could it could look like kind of a smothering, if you want to know the truth. I mean, I think a pimlet in round two could could uh, could get there. I think he can get knockdowns. I think he can get takedowns. So I'm not too worried about that. I, I think he's a very very strong player. Um, let's look at Ferguson. Uh, his money line is poor, so he better have a really strong inside the distance line here and. We have Ferguson inside. I mean, it's just plus 700. It's just not good enough. So here, here would be one of those cases where if his inside the distance line were even reasonable, we would take a shot because I know that Pimlet's going to get high ownership because he looks like such a great play. But Ferguson in and of himself has to look at least somewhat decent, and he just doesn't. So for me, it's Pimlet here. Um, we'll put him instead of Budai for now. Um that makes perfect sense. All right. Now we have uh, the biggest favorite on the card, that being uh, Shak Shakvat Rachmanov as minus 650 against Stephen Thompson. And good job for pricing it up here like this. It makes it very difficult. So 9,700, you know, you don't see this all too often. You know, for a $9,700 fighter to get there, I mean, you need – it might not even be enough to get a first round knockout. You know, you, you might need a first round knockout that comes with, you know, either with a takedown or with say two knockdowns or like that first one minute bonus. So how is this fight going to go? I mean, you have Steven Thompson who, listen, I know that this is the really kind of a weird way of looking at it. And it's, it's very, that's actually a very juvenile way of looking at it, but just to show you, I mean, like, let's pull up his, let's pull up Stephen Thompson's fight logs here. Let's, you just told me the last time he got knocked out. Lost by decision, lost by decision. All right, here we go. So he lost by, he did, he lost by KO in round two. Did he ever get knocked out in the first round? No, of course not. I mean, but that's not exactly fair, right? Because if he's a good fighter and he's gotten this far, I mean, the chances are he probably hasn't ever gotten knocked out in the first round anyway. So just because he hasn't, that doesn't mean that if he doesn't, if he you know, fights the wrong fighter, he, this can't, can't happen. I don't know. I mean, I've seen him fight. And he dances around. He maintains distance. He does whatever. And I, I, listen, I know the way Shavkat wins this fight in the first round. He just comes after him, doesn't care about any shots he might take on the way in, puts him up against the cage, knees him in the face, chips him to the ground, pounds him out, 50 seconds, 135 minutes. I see it. I, I totally see it. Uh, but <laughs> it doesn't. Uh, <laughs> anything short of that, you 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 might be looking at a uh, at a 100-point performance that doesn't get there. Nonetheless, uh well, we didn't even look at the fight odds. What is he minus? Let's take a look again. We didn't even take a look, but I presume he's insane. Uh, yeah, I mean, inside the distance, minus 200. And that's We're actually only minus 150 here. That's sort of interesting. What is he in the first round? I mean, plus, only plus 200? So only 33% of the time he gets him out of it in the first round? What is that second round? finished look like I mean you know what it could, it could look like that Pimlet one though you know he could have gotten a bunch of takedowns and just not finished somehow in the first round and then get there in the second still get 125 uh, it's a very very strong play I mean no matter how you slice it all right Stephen Thompson unfortunately it, it would be nice to play him because you'd be getting a lot of leverage over a very popular big favorite here but Unfortunately, this is just not the way he wins. You know, he's, he's doesn't not going to really win by finish. He's plus like two thousand to finish. That's just not good enough. And, and his his win odds aren't good enough. It's like plus like five hundred or something like that. So, um, it's uh, it's just either my Rachmaninoff or pass or Rachmaninoff. 
uh, or pass, I think. So we could put him in instead of any of these guys, right? 500 level, put him instead of Pimblet for now. Do that. Now we have two fights that are both five rounds. And and remember, you know, it's, it's it, there's a reason why these fights are high owned. When you have five rounds to work with, think about it. That's like, what, 60% more opportunities to rack up points than a three-round fight? Um, now, again, though, that helps more for those fights that, you know, that could go to a decision. Because what usually happens is if you have a three-round fight, if it goes to a decision, you're looking at 80 points usually, unless you have a bunch of takedowns. Whereas if you get another two rounds to rack up significant strikes, it could be 100. So um, both these fights are very, very good. They're very difficult to fade. But I think that the first fight is probably the hardest one to fade because this one is probably going to finish. Well, let's just take a look. So Pantoja versus Brandon Roy minus 190 plus 160. Pricing looks reasonable, 8,600, 7,600. I mean, fights inside the distance, Pantoja inside the distance, minus 125. I mean, that is rough. That is a rough fit. I mean, considering that, considering that he's got freaking five rounds to work with, I mean, how, how do you not play this? Now here, this is this this is an interesting situation. It is no dispute that Pantoja is 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 he the best play on the board? He has to be, right? You have eighty six hundred, and you have an inside the distance line, which is one of the best on the slate. One befitting a ninety one hundred dollar fighter. Plus, you have five rounds to work with. Plus, you have some takedown upside. This is Smash City. Now, what that means, of course is that he's going to be an extremely popular bit of Smash City. So if you can make a case for the opponent in a situation like that, now you're getting leverage and now you're in business. And this is what you have with Brandon Roy Val. So Brandon Roy Val, his inside the distance line is plus like 220, which is light years better than a lot of guys that we talked about. And he's got takedown upside and a decent amount of his finishes are early. So... And if it doesn't work out, he still has five rounds to work with. So this is the fight that I think you have to have 100%. And Pantoja is going to rate out to be the best play. But uh, Roy Val is just fine in and of himself. And you're going to be getting leverage. So I think he is by far the best underdog on this. Well, hang on. Hold that thought. Um, maybe not. So uh, Roy Val, very strong play. Pantoja, very strong play. I would play, I think I'm going to play 100% of this fight, in, even in 150. I, it would take me the probably the 500 lineup to not play one of these guys. So, uh, and if you join the, uh, the, the lineup build show, you'll, you'll talk, and we'll talk about different ways to, uh, to handle this. Because um, I, I think I have a couple of good ideas. So anyway, Leon Edwards versus Colby Covington. Edwards is a minus 170 favorite. Um, and he's only an $8,200 price. So, you know, you got a little bit of line value in him. But here's here's the reality. The reality is this. It's a five-round fight. And Leon Edwards is, you know, you look at his results. He has a decision. Uh, fifth round KO after he was getting beat up. Then a five-round decision, uh, a five-round decision, 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 third round. He is not finisher, okay? He's an amazing fighter and an amazing champion, uh, but he's not a finisher. He is not a DraftKings scorer. He's very similar in a way to uh, Israel Adesanya, who was an amazing striker, yet from a DFS perspective, you could fade him literally every time that he was the favorite. Um, and sometimes even as the underdog. So uh, he's going to be popular because it's a, excuse me, he's going to be sort of popular because it's the main, main event, but hang on. So you have Colby Covington, who's 8K, and here's the deal. His path to victory here, I mean, look at the, look, let's look at the inside the distance line. You have Leon Edwards, who's inside the distance line is what? Plus 300 probably, let's see. Uh, 
Edwards inside the distance is plus, say, about 300. And you have Covington is inside the distance terrible also at plus 500. But if you believe what everybody's telling you, that his path to victory is going to be going to the rest and going to the pressure. And when you look at some of these scores, when he goes for that, so five-round fight, these are decisions, Mike. Decision, 157 points. Here, three takedowns, 139 points, five rounds. Here, uh, 10 takedowns, 172 points, 136 points. You know, uh, I don't know what this fight was all about, but 116 points. So I'm not saying he's going to win, but in his wins, he is going to be smashing. So what does that mean? What that means is two things, three things. Number one is that he's going to be clearly, you know what I said about Pantoja? Clearly the best play on this. Thing, okay. Covington is 100% between the five rounds and the takedowns and the win condition. And all of it is going to be clearly the best play on the slate. That's the first of three things. Second of three things, he's going to be the most popular fighter on this. He just has to be um, because of everything that I just said. And the third thing that means is that, and this doesn't happen too often, if you feel like playing the main event favorite, you're going to be getting some leverage and a lot of it. Uh, so I, I was saying, I don't, I don't know how Edwards is going to do it. I don't know how he's going to going to smash here, but I tell you, I will tell you this, that if you have Edwards and he wins in any way, you are knocking out probably at least what 45% of the lineups. I mean, how, how does, how is Colby Covington not 45% owned at least? I mean, the only person that might take ownership away from him is, 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 uh, is Pantoja, right? But yeah, I think that Covington is, again, totally, three totally different discussions, right? Covington is 100% the best play on the slate. He's also 100% going to be the highest owned. And as a result, I think Edwards is going to be probably the best bit of leverage. Now, here's the question. Is Edwards better leverage than Royval? Um, Probably not, because Royval in and of himself is a pretty good play. So I think that's the difference. So that's, again, that is the analysis from a good play perspective. Now, it's possible that when we do the lineup builds, we get totally different guys. Because when you do lineup builds, you're trying to get unique, you're trying to get low owned, and it's totally different. But uh, this is an important first step is to figure out who the best plays are. And I think we've done a good job of that. Uh, that will do it. Good luck, everyone.